I am very pleased to be joined with Tanya Schindler, uh, who is the Vice Chair of the APF. Thanks for having me. Yes, pleasure to have you. I'm really pleased that you're here. So tell me, uh, Tanya, what's, what is the APF and what is your role there? The APF is the Association of Professional Futurists and I'm the Vice Chair among uh, 12 other board members. And we foster the field of foresight practitioners, so really how we can help organizations or governments to uh, work with the future, to anticipate, but especially to shape the future actively. So we are really um, ambassadors of creating the future, not predicting it. I like the term ambassador of the, of the future in that sense, yeah. because you can help identify, correct me if I'm wrong, of course, but you can help identify trends and, and um, uh, behaviors that could possibly shape uh, and dictate how things might be in the future, mm. exactly, essentially. Yeah, there's different types of uh, futurists. So some do really have uh, specific topics or contents, they research and they're experts in futures of cities and do scenarios or trend research. Uh, but in general, trends is like the foundation everyone does because um, it's what you see, what is emerging, what you're going on that. I would myself put myself more as a general futurist mm -hmm. because I love to conduct or facilitate conversations of the future. So I come in and ask crazy questions and I ask hard questions about the future. We're not giving necessarily the answer, but to get the right people based on different apartments um, of the organization in the room and have a conversation of, okay, maybe I throw a scenario at you and you would say, would your organization survive? How would you act in that? So it's really the point about having the conversation about some of these difficult topics that brings people out of the comfort zone and actually encourages that sort of uh, dialogue to explore some of the areas that maybe not aren't talked about in, in mainstream. Exactly, because there's no way that we can predict the future, at least in the time frame that we're working, the future is 10 years plus or 20, 30. But what you can do is like imagine multiple different pathways. Mm -hmm. So your brain actually becomes way better at making decisions today that lead into different futures and you know the impacts of your decisions. So you mentioned about the time frame. That was a question I was going to ask you in this, in this conversation is, you know, people talk about the futures. Is this, you know, um, you know, the crystal ball, you know, this is going to happen in your future for tomorrow. You should go play the lottery, <laughs> that kind of thing. Or is it the, you know, the, the 10 year, 20 year, you know, more, most organizations are on a quarterly basis, right? Mm -hmm. So when you talk futures from a, a revenue standpoint, there's that perspective, but then there's the other longer term perspective. How is that related to what you do? Well, the problem is if you go in and say, let's think about the three years and what we can change, <laughs> and you work with large organizations, you get exactly that. You're like, do you know our processes? Do you know how long it takes to change or to even order a pencil sometimes? Yeah. So what I say, it's very easy to bring things from far away, close and back into the present or the near future, but it's sometimes hard to think beyond. But if I say, okay, let's imagine 10, 20, 30 years, that's something where the barriers of today become less relevant and you really start more freely to think about the opportunities that could emerge. And as I said, as crazy as it sounds, but I can bring any zombie apocalypse back into the content of, hmm, this could be just a pandemic yeah. into the three, five year time frame. But if we don't start crazy, we're just dealing with the same things that are around us. And we've seen in the past how the future has surprised us. So we need to go beyond our comfort zone and think in those different areas. So um, I would imagine the future can be, these conversations about the future can be uh, influenced by present day events. Like you're saying, mm. things happening around the pandemic, people's frame of mind are gonna be different about what the future might hold then, you know, a, a year before the pandemic. Exactly. Uh, I've seen a lot of data in the intelligence space around CXO's priorities um, and that the, you know, the disruption effort was a low priority prior to COVID and then after COVID it became extremely high priority, mm. obviously for the obvious reasons. Um, so how do you play that sort of perspective differences on the journey of developing this future scenario? Well, the future is always connected with the present and the past. Yeah. So, and it's not linear, so it's not we start it from the present and we look forward to the future. It opens like a cone, but it can be sometimes spiral and it goes back and forth. So we need to really see the patterns of the past and see, okay, something like this emerging again, can we learn from that? Yeah what is in the present that it pushes us into a certain direction and do we want to get pushed so maybe yeah. what can we do differently but then what are the images of the future that pull us towards and a lot of times is that we have those negative images and then we see in the present those 
negative effects or signals that are actually contributing to that. And I say because we are risk adverse, if I think that's the right term, so yeah, people don't adverse, like yeah, worse, yeah. so we more tend to actually do that. The problem is it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Your brain sees so many data that they actually, our brains cannot cope with that. So it looks, okay, you have a negative image of the future. Oh, I see signs in the present that are actually leading to yeah, that. Yeah. So if we force ourselves, prophecy. yeah, but yeah. we force ourselves, okay, what are the future we want to design, we want to live in? And then we see those little pockets of hope or seeds that yeah. we can nurture and grow. And it's never either or. I once got the question, can we just do one scenario? It's like, no, <laughs> there is no one future. It's actually, it's future. That's a hell of a risk. <laughs> yeah. And I'd rather do 10 or 20 not as deep scenarios, yeah. but to trigger a conversation than having one or two who are super deep and super narrow at the end. Yeah. Because what if a crazy event happens and then this is all gone? And your brain really needs to, and we need to learn to make better decisions when crazy things are happening. Yeah. So we need to be way broader in our, our future thinking. So I've got like 27 questions from the last <laughs> comment you made, um, points that I'm making. But one of the things I term uh, uh, in, the, in the intelligence space is I, I call it perpetual disruption. And I term, I look at disruption, it's not an event, but a process because mm. there's disruption around, around us all the time. So I would imagine that this future's process and the conversations about futures is a ongoing reiterative process by which you have to have it as a continuous mm. discussion rather than it's not a one and done and now, okay we have seven scenarios that was the one we're going to play it's ever changing because of disruption that's perpetual right exactly that's the other part because yeah. if you plan and sometimes if you do those deep scenarios, it takes six to eight months. Yeah. But if you look at innovation cycles, they're like shorter than six months by now. So you're almost creating them and then putting them on a table and saying, okay, nice, what's done? Yeah. That's not how futures work. It's really a fluid process and a constant feedback look. And okay, are we still on those pathways? Exactly. What are we observing today? Yep. What future does that kind of like more emerge? And do we want that? And can we start a counter trend? Yeah. Is there something we can do today to actually hint towards a future we more desire? And, and hold back the things that we're even seeing. Yes. So that's why I'm to prepare for what is in the close future and you see that is more and more coming towards you, but really think what, what else would you want to do? Yes. And then backcast from that to say what actions do you need to do today? And in the big organizations, that sometimes takes 10 years. Well, that's what I was going to say, because you, you know, these, these what you're talking about are transformational journeys, right? And and the ability for organizations to respond to these scenarios of this favorable outcome they'd rather have and you kind of work at engine, you know, reverse engineering backwards, yeah. right? The time that it takes for organizations to not only uh, absorb it culturally, inherently in the, in, the, in the DNA of the organization, but physically with their IT systems and the structure of the organization and so forth and so on. You run into a lot of challenges there. So what are, what are some of the things, I'm, I'm sure that in your conversations with um, CXOs in business and enterprise, you are you, you you present these scenarios, but there's always that aspect of the the application or the implementation, the execution, and I, I call it more of that transformational story narrative that you have to mm. take a person through. And how do we get from current scenario to this future state uh, within a realistic you know our and of course halfway through it could change mm. you know so there's the element of risk how do you manage that with organizations that's where sometimes people find if they be part of a long scenario planning process and others have not then it's hard to kind of yeah, convince exactly. them from the story yeah. so this is why i'm really more disruptive and i bring sometimes four more broader scenarios and i have different people from different uh, departments so from sales from marketing from r&d yes, from hr yeah. on one table and they have to think okay how would your organization survive or react in this world what are your clients it's almost doing a business model canvas mm -hmm. but in the future and saying okay would your products still work but you're making it up with different players which adds more depth and, and exactly and, and, and um a robustness to, to the sort of scenarios that you're yeah. painting. And the key is that they always have to do at least two and two quite opposite scenarios. So yeah. They have to think differently, okay, wow, how it's complex. with one really tech driven, then one has a big social shift yeah, in it, yeah. or border shift, or geopolitical. And then at the end, we go back and we say, okay, so maybe what are some aspects that you still develop that are quite robust in all of those scenarios mm -hmm. that work? Or what has emerged that you think is actually a preferred way to go? Yeah. And then you have that. But you never have just your preferred scenarios. You always have the alternatives to also see yeah. what other pathways come. 
Um, the same as you don't just have alternatives, you really need to think about the future that your organization wants to create as well and to make decisions on yeah. that. So I'm going to dial this back to the intelligence uh, side of things because as, as a, from a skip standpoint, um, we've had many discussions around the intelligence ecosystem, mm. the broadening um, application areas around intelligence in pretty much anything that's data driven, uh, data generated. Um, so from an intelligence standpoint, how would you define or how would you relate the role of intelligence in this future's thinking? Hmm. That's where I'm uh, seeing it's emerging to what we call futures intelligence, oh, right? Well, application yeah. is good, yeah. Good, but good the name. problem with futures intelligence, as you said before, intelligence normally is based on data and data only exists on the present yeah. and the past. So how are we going with futures intelligence or data that does not yet exist? Yeah. And this is where I really look into the synergy of artificial intelligence and human intelligence. Yeah. So you bring people into a room with quite diverse backgrounds because you can only imagine things based on the experience you made in the past. So if you only have people speaking one language, one culture, one job, they always think most likely in a certain direction and you miss a lot of things. Yeah. So you bring diverse people in the room or even online, you get 100 people globally yeah. and think about a bigger Everyone topic. Everyone has an opinion. Yeah. 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 And then you really, and you really ask them about the future, say, what do you expect? What mm -hmm. do you hope? What do you fear? Because all of them can be wrong, all of them could be right, we don't know. Yeah. But it's very interesting to see those different aspects of what people see and um, emerge or fear because of their experience. And then you use AI because it's a lot of data that is created from humans to make little stories of that and make yeah. sense. Yeah. Because humans are way better on images and stories and narratives because we learned that. Yeah. Our grandma told us <laughs> stories in bed. And we really can deal with that way better than just like small uh, data pieces, especially if you're not just talking with data driven people. Yeah. And in the organization, we always have everyone. So if we want to bring everyone on this in a future's journey, we kind of need to create those narratives people can relate and participate mm -hmm. on. And then really discuss on that saying, what if? What if is a great question to think about. Yeah. And then as an organization to make decisions on, okay, then if this is the future we want to create, what do we need to do? So it's not just this passive um, reacting to the past data and making decisions to become better than your competitor, mm -hmm. but to think, what do we need to start now to actually create a future yes. that is more striving? Create for a us? scenario that you would want to have uh, yeah. and, and have organizations behave in and, 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 and people to behave in. Okay. So you mentioned about AI, and that's, that's a, a, a topic, obviously, from the intelligence platform is uh, front and center these days. Everything's generated by AI, open AI, and so forth and so on. The use of AI, and this is something I talk to a lot of um, folks in the intelligence space about, about managing the data that we have today, because to, to gather and to generate any sort of relevant insights, you got to employ tools, and AI is you know, one of the tools that can help us do that. Um, one of the things that I always ask about is you know, utilizing AI as, because um, you're saying the future, of course, no data around the future, so you got to use past to help to interpret what the future could be, so there's this predictive element. Uh, that AI can help us with. But I also mention about not only predictive, but there should be a prescriptive element that basically outlines not only what could happen, but what you should be doing about it. Mm. And I think that's what's missing in, in a, a lot of the AI scenarios that organizations are using. It tells more about the here and now and not necessarily how you should prepare for the future and on, on these different uh, applications. And it's probably because it's quite human as well. We would love to have that machine to push a button, right? It's like, well, people love to have come with the crystal ball and tell them the future yeah. because because one of them is this feeling like, oh, I, I cannot do anything about it. So I rather like ride the wave. And on the other hand, it's this uncertainty that drives us crazy. Yeah, yeah. So um, with AI, I think they probably become quite good in the near future in one, two, three years to see what is emerging. Mm -hmm. But as I said, in 10, 20, 30, the, if AI is only trained by the past data, and then most the AI is, is trained by a specific uh, person or background, just where mostly currently the money is to train AI, yeah. then you get quite biased on how to imagine the future course, as well. Yeah. So this is why I say bring in some human speculations and then let AI deal with that. Mm -hmm. So prompting, learn how to prompt AI to become creative. I think in my talk earlier, I used this creativity enhancement. AI can be creative, but I think it gets more creative if it actually gets human stimulus from of course, it. Yes, and yes, to yes. 
input this. Yeah. And then on the other hand, we still need to to learn to handle this uncertainty and make good decisions in uncertainty yeah. because there will always things emerging that we haven't even foreseen or imagined. And the more we train us to yeah to deal with that, the better we are getting on, on reacting fast or reacting before it happens. I see. So so if you were to give 30 seconds advice to the viewer of this, of this uh, uh, dialogue that we're having here. Um, what would you say to that person in regards to um, the perspective of the future scenario? How do, how do people, what should the viewer take away from this conversation from a futures intelligence standpoint? Mm. Well, first of all, the future is not written yet, <laughs> yeah. and that's a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing. So it is really on us to say, okay, what decisions can we make today to actively take part and to write a future that we want to create and that's most may beneficial for society, for economies, um, and for the environment. Yeah. Because in the end, we want to create a world we all want to live in. Yeah. And um, although we have kind of the more tangible way to the technology, because it's exciting, it's more easy to really think broader and think about the impacts on society and environmental, because we want to be part of that. And then secondly, to actively decide how can you create an intelligence system or futures intelligence in your whole organization mm -hmm. by including the uh, employees and be proud of the story. Because I feel sometimes organizations you say not taking that futures responsibility. So what purpose is your organization? What futures challenges are they taking on? Yeah. And we have employees that spend half of their lives in organization yeah. to actually create something. And I bet they're performing well better if they actually show up and they know what they're contributing of to. Of course. Yeah. And we miss that part of it. And I think this linkage is not just like benefit for mental health, but it will outperform um, the other companies who were just driven looking at their numbers instead of creating impact. It's the power of the, 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 um, um, the, the volume of people's inputs, they're, that they're, they're, they feel that they're not only part of, this, of the organization, but they're part of the, the decision making, which is important. And uh, I love that sort of uh, perspective because I think a lot of organizations can learn from that sort of behavior. Mm. Um, too many times I think um, it's looked at as being a negative rather than that uh, a positive. And I think that organizations are better off in that sort of uh, employee engagement uh, effort around so, you know, the determinations of how things might look in the future. Um, yeah, this has been great. Tanya, I so much appreciate this. Uh, Thank your, you so much. your involvement with SKIP, uh, you are on the advisory board for SKIP and I, and I welcome that and I thank you for having your contribution to that, to that space. But I want to thank you for this conversation. Folks, Tanya Schindler, <laughs>